This chapter talks about the molecular basis of inheritance. Two of the most renowned sets of bases regarding the molecular basis of inheritance and DNA belong to James Watson and Francis Crick, shown here on the left, traditionally attributed to the discovery of DNA structure, and Rosalind Franklin, of whom was little known to have contributed largely to elucidating DNA structure, their infamous Photo 51, which was an X-ray crystallograph of GMI's helical form. Some of the founding contribution to DNA structure include the work of Mendel, of whom discovered the work of genes or factors in the heredity of traits. Next was Morgan, who determined that genes were located on chromosomes. Griffith later added to the knowledge by saying that it was due to the assimilation of external substances that changes resulted in genotype and phenotype by a process known as transformation. And finally, Avery added onto Griffith's research by finding that the transforming agent to cause these global changes was DNA. It was the research led by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase that determined that DNA caused disease pathology in bacteria by way of uh, infectious T4 bacteriophages. The famous Chagraff rules were coined by Erwin Shergoff, who determined that the ratio of bases, adenine and thymine, were similar, and cytosine and guanine were equally similar, uh, This uh, showing that this was a result of the fact that these bases were complementarily bond to one another. Uh, then Watson and Crick then pulled all of this information together to provide evidence for the double helical structure of DNA. More importantly, the structure of DNA was determined by the work of Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilsons, who used a new technique, uh, which used X-ray crystallography, by which a molecule is frozen and a photograph is taken of the biomolecule to determine the actual double helical structure of DNA. It was James Watson, upon learning that DNA was helical in shape, that he calculated the width of the helix and the spacing of the bases, which he found to be about 3.4 um, angstrom. The structure of DNA consists of two polynucleotide strands, shown there uh, in the upper right, wrapped around one another in a double helical form. Next section looks at DNA replication. There are typically three representations of DNA. One highlighting the key features of DNA, the next the partial chemical structure, and last the space filling model showing the full behavior of electron space filling attributes. The way that DNA binds to one another is by way of purines binding to pyrimidines. Adenine binds to thymine and guanine to cytosine. The adenine to thymine bond is held together by two hydrogen bonds, guanine and cytosine by three, and each stack of purines to pyrimidines is bound together by van der Waal interactions. Watson and Crick found the strands were obviously complementary in their base pairing. And it was because of this that they showed that DNA had the capacity for self-replication. So let's go ahead and read through these steps. First thing we start off with is a parent molecule has two complementary strands of DNA. Each base is paired by hydrogen bonding with its specific partner, A with T, C with G. Next, and really the first step in replication, is the separation of the two DNA strands. Each parental strand now serves as a template that determines the order of the nucleotides along a new complementary strand. Next, the nucleotides are connected to form the sugar phosphate backbones of the new strands. Each daughter DNA molecule consists of one parental strand and one new strand. DNA replication proceeds through a semi-conservative manner in which the two strands of the parent molecule separate and each functions as a template for the synthesis of a new complementary strand, shown in model B. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at this process. At the origin of replication begins the formation of bubbles. 
This replication fork is the Y-shaped region where new strands of DNA begin to elongate. Helicase is the enzyme that first cuts open and untwists the DNA at the replication fork, along with topoisomerase, which unwinds the strands. Then it is the work of DNA polymerase, which begins the elongation of DNA by adding the free nucleotides to the template strand. DNA replication proceeds in an anti-parallel manner where one strand runs in a 3 to 5 prime direction, the other in a 5 to 3 prime direction. In DNA replication, there are two strands. One is known as the leading strand, and this is where replication is simplest and occurs the fastest. Here the synthesis is towards the replication fork. In the lagging strand, the synthesis proceeds away from the replication fork and requires Okazaki fragments joined by DNA ligase, which all proceed in the 5 to 3 direction, away from the replication fork. For the lagging strand, before adding the Okazaki fragments, an initiation primer is required to begin the replication process. To summarize at the replication fork, the leading strand is copied continuously into the fork from a single primer. The lagging strand is copied away from the fork in short segments, each requiring a new primer. Since the process of replication occurs so fast, there are multiple opportunities for creating errors in the reading and adding of the nucleotide bases. To safeguard against large mutation rates during replication, DNA mismatch repair mechanisms are put in place which excise or remove the mismatched bases and replace them with the correct base or bases, after which DNA ligase then proceeds to stick the ends together, sealing the backbone. That was just a look ahead at the telomeres, which are added to the ends of DNA to prevent genes from being eroded through multiple rounds of DNA replication. The enzyme telomerase uses a short molecule of RNA as a template to extend the three prime end of the telomere. And this concludes chapter 16. If you have any questions, please email me. Thanks.